Welcome to this episode of the Rooster Crows podcast. My name is Reverend Stephen Milton, and today we're talking about refugees. Specifically, I want to look at the way in which the Canadian and American governments have recently made it much harder for refugees to claim asylum in our countries. The reason this came about was that the two countries agreed to renegotiate an agreement called the Safe Third Country Agreement. This has drastically reduced uh, the ease with which refugees can claim asylum in Canada, and it's going to reduce the number of refugees coming into Canada, no doubt. So in this podcast, I'm going to be talking to three experts, two of whom who deal with refugees all the time, one in the United States and one in Canada. And the third person I'll be speaking to is actually a former refugee himself who now teaches ethics at one of the universities in Toronto. I'm going to start by talking to Jen McIntyre, who is the co-chair of the U.S.-Canada Border Network, which is a non-governmental organization which defends the rights of refugees. And I speak to her from her home in Halifax, and I want to get a sense of how the Safe Third Country Agreement has been working for Canada and what it means now that it has changed. Yes, the Safe Third Country Agreement is a bilateral agreement between Canada and the U.S., It came into effect at the very end of 2004. And the idea is it's like a responsibility sharing. Some of us like to call it responsibility shirking, but it's a responsibility sharing agreement where uh, the intention is to ensure that somebody makes the refugee claim in the first of the two countries that they land in. So if somebody arrives in the United States and they're supposed to make their what's called an asylum claim in in the United States and not use it as a transit country to come to Canada and make a claim. So if they came to Canada's border, then they wouldn't be able to make a refugee claim here if they already were in the U.S. Um, So it only applies at land borders, not at airports and not at seaports. Um, So it applies like people coming up to the the border. And prior to 2023 in March, it only applied at official ports of entry. So that meant, you know, one of the more or less 120 official ports of entry between our two countries where there is a Canada Border Services Agency post. If someone was to present themselves at the border, Order, they would be turned back and told that they should be making their asylum claim in the U.S. instead of in Canada. There are exceptions to the Safe Third Country Agreement, so certain people would be allowed to come and make their claim in Canada. Primarily, those are people who meet what's called the family member exception, so they have a close relative in Canada with a qualifying immigration status, but it also applies to people who might be unaccompanied minors, meaning they don't have a parent or legal guardian in either country. It applies to people who are document holders, and so that would be someone who doesn't, you know, has a visa to come into Canada or doesn't require a visa to come into Canada, but does to the U.S. So the biggest example of that would be citizens of Mexico. Um, And there are also exceptions for certain people who are considered uh, public interest exceptions. Um, It largely has to do with the death penalty. As a non-lawyer, I'm not good at explaining that particular exception, but it does exist. Okay. And I mean, you've been working in this sector for a while. Have you met refugees who have come into Canada uh, along these non-official border crossings? Oh yeah. Met hundreds of refugees who come in because most people don't meet one of those exceptions. I mean, it's not, you know, many people who have a close family member in Canada or who happen to be an unaccompanied minor. Uh, So yeah, I've met, I've met hundreds of people over the year who, over the years who have come into Canada at an unofficial port or entry place. I wouldn't call it a port of entry, but an unofficial place on the border, which means between ports of entry. Uh, And to them, the safe third country agreement prior to March 25th of 2023 didn't apply. So if they were able to cross into Canada between a port of entry, then they could proceed with filing a refugee claim. (laughs) 
I'm Dylan Corbett, uh, and I'm the executive director of the Hope Border Institute. Uh, we're a Catholic research and advocacy organization. Uh, we work on social justice issues at the US-Mexico border, uh, including immigration. Um, and I'm also an official at the, the, the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development uh, at the Vatican. Um, and uh, in that work, I've, I've worked on issues of migration um, in the North American, Mexican, Central American, and Caribbean context. Can you explain just what is the intention for the Safe Third Country Agreement from the American government's perspective? So I think you have to understand it as, a, as part of a broader strategy of deterrence. Um, we've had migration uh, issues in the United States at our southern border for some time. And the, the United States is moving more and more in the direction of leaning on other countries to limit migration and frankly, to adopt its own policies, um, which are which are complicated and complex. Um, they're complex in the sense that there's there are some protections, um, there are some core commitments of our country uh, to meeting the needs of asylum seekers and people who need protection. But at the same time, um, largely because of political realities, we're also acting to limit migration, and in many in many instances those core commitments to protection are being eroded. And so I think you have to see it as, as one tool in the US's toolbox to begin to limit, or not begin, but to continue to limit migration. And unfortunately, it's having that effect of um, a corrosive effect on our broader commitment to the rights of vulnerable people on the move. And how does it work in practice? Um, if uh, someone from Guatemala or Venezuela uh, appears at the border at the US, under the Safe Third Country Agreement, what can the border agent say to them? If you have come to the border, for example, from Honduras, where many migrants are coming from, or Guatemala, or El Salvador, um, or if you're a Haitian migrant, many Haitian migrants, you know, they first went to Brazil and may, they may have made their way up through Central, uh, through, through South America and Central America. Or if you're from Venezuela, so you're in South America and you have to pass through what's really one of the most dangerous places in the world for migrants today, the Darien Gap, uh, because it's it's very rural. It's well, it, rather it's it's jungle. Um, the, the, there's really no rule of law in many parts to speak of, so there's a lot of exploitation that happens. The terrain is very difficult to cross. It's mountainous, and you have to cross through deep ravines and valleys and high mountains. So. If those people are crossing borders and crossing other countries, like Mexico, for example, the burden is on them to prove why they didn't ask for asylum in those countries first. And if they didn't, um, then they have to they have to overcome an incredibly high threshold in order to apply for asylum. So the burden is on asylum seekers to justify why they're seeking asylum at the at the US Mexico border. And that's troublesome. Um, and, and, and if you look at the history of say third countries agreements, they, you know, they started in Europe, um, uh, I think a couple of decades ago now. And, and the intention was basically to keep migrants away from countries of destination. That was the intention to, to put the burden more on countries that were closer to sending countries. Um, and that's troubling uh, because it's 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 a way of outsourcing the issue, and that's really been one key component of the U.S. strategy on migration. Let's continue to sort of outsource this. So whether it's pushing migrants to Mexico under Title Forty Two or or remain in Mexico, that other Trump policy, um, or now you know for, forcing migrants to make their claims in other countries, we're trying to push migrants not just keep them from crossing our border, but push them further and further uh, south, in, in this case, towards other borders so that they don't come at all. So it's primarily about, and this is why it's troubling, the, the rationale is about deterrence. It's not about protection. Um, and that cuts against our ideals and, and it cuts against the safety and security of those who need it most. I was interested in a refugee's perspective on these issues, so I sought out Professor Nestor Medina. 
He teaches ethics at Emmanuel College in the University of Victoria in Toronto. He arrived in Canada in the 1990s. I, I was one of those persons that was impacted by the Civil War in Guatemala. And I got to, to, to Rio Grande and I needed to, to, you know, to cross over, literally. And, and so there were a range of Christians who, who helped me out to, to make that, that trip across. And, and later when I arrived to, to the States and I was detained, it was um, actually um, Mennonites who approached me to say that they'd be happy to help me out to, to see how they, I could make connections with, with Canada come to Canada and and pretty much the rest is history to the degree that that when I came out of the detention center I was I went I was sent to Lubbock Texas and in Lubbock Texas there was a group of people all of them Christians there were and um, there were Anglicans or Episcopalians as they call them over there and there were Presbyterians and there were Catholics and all of them were working together to to create the conditions for someone like myself to, to live there until uh, my papers from Canada were formalized and I would receive and be able to migrate. And so that's, that's kind of the short of it. Yeah. Now, given the new rules of the Safe Third Country Agreement, would you be allowed to come to Canada that way now? Not at all. <laughs> Just absolutely not. In what would happen is, of course, they would deport me back and 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 expect me to ask or request for uh, apply for political asylum there and and see what happens. And, and 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 so the assumption is, of course, that when you are when you are in the in the present condition, when you are sent back, uh, the assumption is that you will be treated fairly and and that. Um, we know, at least in the present conditions, that the immigration system is just too prejudiced against immigrants enough to give them a, a fair trial or a fair, a fair hearing. And so you've probably given a fair bit of thought to the Christian debt to refugees and the rights to claiming asylum as a, as a theologian and someone who studies ethics. What conclusions have you reached on your own having lived through this experience? Well, it, it depends on how we see it. I mean, if we, if we look at it from the perspective of socioeconomics, um, this idea about economic refugees is, is, I think, is a misnomer because it, it, it fails in recognizing the intricate interconnection between a country like Canada and a country from which those people who are migrating come from. Um, we know uh, that there are, uh, for example, Canadian mining corporations that that have contributed to the physical displacement and sometimes even killing of, of people and who many of them end up migrating. And so many of the benefits that this economy here in, in Canada we could celebrate or, uh, or benefit from are just unfortunately implicated in the displacements of these people. So there is a certain a certain economic, um, what would I say, debt that we have because our, our economy is being then subsidized by, by the displacements of these communities. And, and that's not hard to find. I mean, we find that all over the place. So, so there is a sense in which in which Canada's also in, Canada's invest investment in how things are done in other countries also inevitably contributes to the creation of immigrants that, that we then end up seeing uh, knocking at your, our door and that we see them as just foreigners, people who come, people who just want to come and get uh, take advantage of our own uh, resources. But in reality, many of them would just, I personally, myself included, I, I wouldn't have thought about migrating had it not been because, had it not been because of a particular need that I had in the, the present, at the time, political circumstances. 
Right. And um, it's interesting. You mentioned the uh, when you came across the United States border, the Christians that you met in the sanctuary movement um, called themselves the Underground Railroad. And, you know, I'm a I'm a white Canadian and we're all very proud that we were the destination for the Underground Railroad and so many, um, uh, you know, enslaved black people from the uh, southern plantations ended up here and, you know, they populated our towns and our cities. Um, But you know, I think the truth is that we wouldn't do the Underground Railroad now. Right? Not Canadian, by a long shot. Yeah, the Canadian <laughs> government was so proud of itself in the 19th century saying that we're better than the Americans. People can yeah. cross our borders, sneak into our country, and they didn't honor extraditions, right? The Americans would say, we want those people back, and the Canadian government said no. Whereas now, I think those people would just be stopped at the border and be asked, well, why didn't you just stay in Guatemala? Or why didn't you apply for right. uh, asylum in Mexico if you walk through Mexico? That's correct. Well, of course, there, there's been a development, right? I mean, the, as, as you know, the safe third country agreement uh, was only in reference to official ports of entry, right? And so, but as you know, probably also know, is that during the Trump administration, there were a lot of people who felt that the U.S. was in a safe country to be in. And so that's where we have Roxman Road, right? I mean, as the place where droves of people that started to cross over because they thought, you know, with the criminalization of, uh, of non-status immigrants from Latin America and they're being haunted by ICE and and the limitations that were set in place for countries, for people who were from countries that where the majority population were Muslim, all those things prejudiced uh, the immigration system, right? And so that development, you know, started to ferment. And, and so the signing of, of these new changes uh, are basically Canada's equalizing themselves to the level of the U.S. and saying we're going to ab- adopt the same measures whereby we really we really think that the United States is a safe country where people can be sent back to. And that, I, I think, I think that, that human rights advocates are right. It's just not a safe country to send people back to. The whole premise of the safe third country is... A fallacy, this belief that the United States is a safe country, and not only because of detention conditions, and not only because, uh, you know, of gun violence and like daily life in the US not being safe, but there are actually groups of people who are not afforded equal opportunity to have their asylum claims adjudicated in the US in the way that they would be in Canada. So, for example, you know, the United States has a a bar on making an asylum claim if you have been in the country for longer than a year. Well, many people have found themselves in the United States and something has changed in their country abroad uh, while they're in the U.S. and they are, they've been in the U.S. too long to make their asylum claim. Um, or there were things that were introduced under the former president of the United States that made it much more difficult for people who are facing domestic violence based on gender uh, discrimination to access asylum in the United States. So if someone is is fleeing fleeing domestic violence, their possibility of accessing asylum is is quite low. The same if people fleeing gang violence in the United States. And those are grounds for which people are regularly afforded refugee protection in Canada. And there are also people, you know, certain countries that Systematically, the U- United States doesn't recognize uh, people as as being refugees from. Like an example would be Colombians. The acceptance rate of Colombians is very, very low in certain parts of the United States. It also depends on where your asylum claim is being adjudicated. Um, whereas in Canada, there's a, a, a you know a significantly high rate of acceptance for people who are fleeing persecution in Colombia. So it's not equal opportunity for protection in either country. And so people are making their decisions as to where they want to go in a rational way, like where they will actually find safety. And whether that's because, you know, they are a person who identifies with a certain religion or they are black and they don't feel safe in the United States because of that, but they would in Canada, that's a rational decision to make, to come to the country that actually uh, 
offer safety or it's because you're a woman fleeing to domestic violence and you hear that in Canada you're given protection and you're unlikely to find it in the U.S. That's a rational decision to seek safety in Canada. But the agreements that our, that our countries have struck don't don't honor that rationality, but rather say, no, you you need to just make your claim in whatever country you arrive in. And, and it doesn't matter that you'll be prejudiced because you arrived in the U.S. because you had to cross a land border because there was no way you were going to get a visa to get on a plane to Canada. Too bad for you. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a real shame. And I think that's why we call it, many of us who are advocates, responsibility shirking, not responsibility sharing, because it allows our country to just sort of push it south of the border and not not worry about the actual human beings and whether or not they have access to, to protection in the U.S. You know, politicians, often politicians and other, other groups, they, they over the years, they've tried to persuade us that there's something about migration that we ought to fear. And I can tell you, as, as, as someone who lives on the border, as an El Pasoan, that's just not true. Migration isn't something we have to be afraid of. Rather, it gives us resiliency and strength. And, and, and we're, we're, we're a beautiful community, not in spite of migration, but because of migration. And if you look at that from a, a deeper point of view, a religious point of view, I think that, and, and, and we see this because we're, we're a bridge community. So we see migrants coming through our community all the time. We always have, we've been, we've been this way for hundreds of years. Um, you know, migrants are not, you know, they're not something to, they're not people that we ought to be afraid of. Rather migration presents us with an opportunity to be in solidarity. Uh, I'm in El Paso, so we're, we're on the border. Um, we're right on the border. If I looked out my window right now, I can see I can see the houses and the mountains over in Mexico. Um, so we have a sister city that I can see right now, looking out my my window, um, and that's a sister city in Mexico. And a lot of Americans, um, when they think about El Paso, the border, they think of somewhere that's dangerous. That's that's sort of you know, where the law is, you know, there's no law, the Wild West, sort of those old archetypes of a lawless society, migrants sort of pouring across the border. And and that's just not true. Um, this is a community that, you know, we're, we're more than 80% Mexican American, a quarter of our population is foreign born. We do have a lot of undocumented folks about, you know, just under 10% of our population. Um, but we're a, we're a beautiful community. We're one of the safest communities in the United States consistently year after year. Uh, we're vibrant. We speak two languages. Um, you know, it's a community of faith. People go across, across the border every day to study, to, to worship, to be with family, um, to, 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 to engage in, in the economy. And so there's a, there's a beautiful, vibrant dynamism that gets lost, I think, in rhetoric about about migration and rhetoric about the border. When I see migrants here at the border, you know, they are people who are are like the prophets of old. You know, they're denouncing a world that just doesn't work for a lot of people. There's a lot of injustice, a lot of economic inequality. Um, the world is on fire because of climate change. I mean, they are they are living proof that that the way that we're living is not right. They're prophets in that sense. They're prophets of a world that, that's out of whack, a human family that's not in solidarity. I was really struck by Dylan Corbett's comment about climate change. But what happens when entire countries need to be abandoned? due to rising seas or heat. I asked Nestor Medina, the professor of ethics and a former refugee himself. Our present system is not prepared to deal with that reality, at least not yet. And I don't know if if we are, if in within, I don't know, five or 10 years, we're actually gonna be ready for that uh, because the system is too, too uh, what should I say, too constrained to enforcing Canada's sovereignty, 
ensuring that people respect the rule of law and and not putting it paying attention to the actual reality of the people from which they are coming. Uh, not a long time ago, uh, people from Mexico were considered to be just simply economic refugees, and and it was simply because of the extreme violence that it became too obvious that they were not just economic refugees, that they were actually fleeing the violence um, uh, from 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 Mexico. So. Uh, I think we're in for for um, for for interesting times. I was going to say, well, I'm going to say it. it's going to be a, an interesting ride for sure. Oh, what would I like to see? I would like to see the safe third country disappear, be rescinded, to see this agreement either be rescinded on our government's own volition, which would be, I think, obviously the ideal is to recognize that this is not good for Canada. It's not good for our reputation and it's not good for the people who live here and our spirit of welcoming and it's especially not good for people who are seeking safety in Canada. For people who hear this and would like to help in some way, is there something that they should say to their politicians um, to try and change the way things are working? Absolutely. I would say they should reach out to their federal politicians and they should call to rescind the Safe Third Country Agreement. Uh, there, you know, there's a petition going on in Parliament right now. There is an open letter from the Canadian Council for Refugees. Uh, there are many statements that you can sign on to or read or learn more about to follow up and, and reach out to your politician and say that this like this doesn't fit with my values as a Canadian to to close the border to people who who need protection so can call to to rescind it for Dylan Corbett of the Hope Border Institute what happens next depends on how we see refugees he sees them not as a crisis but as profits of the future we need to build and so there, there, you know, there's a prophetic dimension to migration, and I think God is working through people who are on the move to call us to some pretty basic realities that 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 unless we pursue the path of justice and solidarity, um, you know, those are the things that really count. Um, we'll continue to, um, you know, not live up to our human vocation, um, which is you know, to, to, to be in union with one another and in union with God.